This program is sponsored by the Church of God International and supported by our viewers. In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now, your host, Bronson James. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Armor of God telecast. I'm excited to be with you to discuss the following subject with you. It's titled, Why Jesus? But before I get to that, let's establish some parameters here. There are a number of religions with which you are familiar on the face of the earth, and they have accredited to them certain people who are called the founders of those religions. In fact, Jesus Christ is described as the founder of the Christian religion. More about that a little bit later. But when you deal with things like Buddhism and Shintoism and uh, perhaps Hinduism, even Judaism, uh, we attribute the founding of those religions to certain people. In Judaism, it is commonly accepted that Moses was the founder of Judaism. In the case of Mohammedism, as it's sometimes called anciently, now calls it, called Islam, uh, Muhammad, the prophet, was credited with founding that religion. But moving ahead a little closer to our times, in the 18th century or 19th century, somewhere around in there, a man named Joseph Smith also is credited with starting a religion, and it's called Mormonism. Now, I'm not going to disparage any of these religions. That's not the point of this program at all. But to give us a talking point, a starting place to identify why Jesus is distinct from the founders of all of those other religions. This is important because there are some allegations that Jesus is superior as a founder, if you will, as a personality, he is described in the Bible, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, as the Son of God. That's called into question by some religions. In fact, some suggest that he's merely a prophet, like Abraham, like Moses, like Noah and other people, uh, but to elevate him to the position as the Son of God, or even God. Do you know back in the fourth century there was a controversy led by a man named Arius? Arius was a man who said that Jesus was not God, and it led the church at that time, the Roman Catholic Church, if you will, under the aegis or the authority of a man named Constantine, the Emperor of Rome. He brought together a bunch of scholars, and one of the subjects they discussed was the Godhead, and to find out where Jesus fits in the Godhead. They came up with the Trinitarian dogma. Uh, by the way, it's not from the scriptures. It was a decision, a fiat, if you will, uh, by those accumulated intelligent men who decided this is how we will describe the Godhead. But more about that a little bit later. Jesus Christ, how is it that he's more significant in my mind, in the minds of those who support this program, than the other prophets and other, other founders of religion? We're going to discuss that and come to a conclusion, and hopefully with the material we're offering you today, you will come to learn why Jesus is the most important figure to come into human existence and what it means to you personally. So let's talk about that, but first let me tell you about what we're offering in today's program. This is an opportunity for you to learn some more about who Jesus is, and more importantly, why Jesus. We have a sermon by Tony Buchert, who is now a presenter here on the Armor of God telecast, and the title of that sermon, a CD for you, is Who is Jesus Christ? That's important to know. Is he merely a prophet? Is he merely a nice guy? 
Isn't he, is he just someone who came on the scenes and started a religion and, and left, and now it's up to us to live out what he intended, what he instigated? Well, you can learn more about that when you get that CD, but in, more importantly, to be personal with you, we have a booklet that I think is going to help you develop a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's entitled Comforter, Helper, and Counselor. Comforter, Jesus is that. He says, if I go away, I'm going to send you another comforter, but it's under the responsibility that I designate to that entity, that power, because I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is our comforter. He is our helper. He's called in the scripture our elder brother, our high priest, and more importantly, our counselor. He's our advocate with the Father. All of those things are designated to him, unlike other prophets, unlike other founders of various aspects of religion. Jesus is quite significant. So all it takes for you to do is to dial us up at one 578 8791 That'll be on your screen, and we'll repeat it again at the end of the telecast. But also, you can go to our website at www.cgi.org. And when you get there, you can order material, sermons, all kinds of uh, things are available to you there, including accessing our webcast. If you just follow the links on the home page, it will get you to the location. Uh, we webcast every Saturday, and you can uh, tune in to what's going on down in Tyler, Texas at the home church office there. And I believe that you will be enhanced by tuning in to our webcast. But on to today's program, Why Jesus? Well, there's a scripture I want to turn to to indicate to you the New Testament believers like the Apostle Paul who writes to a church at Ephesus and encourages them on this point of where Jesus stands in the panoply of things. I said the Apostle Paul, let me restate that. It's Peter who makes this statement. It's in the book of Acts. And let's take a look at chapter 4, Acts, the fourth chapter. Now, let me let the, say, let the predicate, set the predicate for this. The day of Pentecost was on uh, the day of Pentecost, and it was in the second chapter of the book of Acts. That's when the disciples of the followers of Jesus Christ were empowered in a magnificent, spectacular way, empowering them to go forth and preach and share the good news, the gospel, of the kingdom of God. Well, as a result of that empowerment, the third chapter describes Peter and John going up into the temple, and there sits a man who is impotent. He can't walk. And he's brought to that location every day to secure alms or gifts from people who will take sympathy or have empathy, empathy upon him and give him some coins as they walk into the temple. I don't know of any potentially better place to be than at a church that claims to help the poor. Uh, there are some injunctions by Jesus Christ to look out uh, for the poor among us. Well, so here he is at the temple as Peter and John are going in to pray. Rather than brushing him aside as so many did, Peter and John looked at him. And the scripture says that Peter looks him in the eye and says, look, we don't have any silver or gold. But such as we have, give we unto you, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, the marvelous thing about this is this event results in attention being brought to the disciples in a spectacular way. And the leaders and the religious leaders of that day decide to call them in question. That brings us to the fourth chapter. The fourth chapter uh, describes the situation this way in the very first verse. And as they spoke unto the people, speaking of Peter and John, the disciples, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. You see, the Sadducees were a denomination in Jesus' day, Jews who did not believe in the resurrection. So to assert that Jesus had been dead 
and resurrected. Let's pause there for a moment. Every founder of every religion that I know of is still dead, but not Jesus. Furthermore, the Apostle Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 15 this way by saying, upwards of 500 plus people saw him alive and testify to that reality. You know how important that is, how impactful that is? If you believe that Jesus founded the Christian religion, that's okay to believe that, but let me assert this to you. Not only if you believe he was the founder of the Christian religion, he sustains it because he is alive. The scriptures are going to show you that. But back to the fourth chapter. After the rulers have called them into question and want to know, note in verse 7, when they had set them, the disciples, in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? You know, this is amazing to me how people can get so sidetracked on uh, tangential issues, unimportant issues. You know, the most important thing that happened in this time was that a man who was once crippled now can walk, free of his pain, free of his debility. Now he should be celebrated. The event should be headline news, you know, fair and balanced. Uh, how could you not emphasize the fact that this man was crippled, but now by the power of the name of Jesus Christ, he walks? Look at what Paul says, or excuse me, Peter says, uh, in response to this inquiry by the religious authorities of his day. Verse 10, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, now, that's an indictment because they were complicit in conspiring against Jesus Christ because of the miracles he did, because of the healings he wrought, because of the gospel he taught. They wanted to silence any followers of this man because it was condemnatory towards them. They were brought back to their modest minds and realizing, you know what? Uh, we might have blown it, but we don't want to be held accountable for it. We don't want to be eschewed as uh, evil because we caused this man to die. But they did not hear it. Yeah, he was dead, but he's now alive. Well, let's read on to see what Peter says. Whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Look at verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Wow. You mean Jesus has it like that? Why Jesus? Well, you can't be saved any other way. Oh, you may be a good person. You may have good qualities. You may be a person of character. In all of those religions that I've cited earlier in the program, you may have all of that, but you will not have the ultimate salvation promised in the Word of God. I know some of you are thinking, well, there are some additional words to God, other revelations. More about that in a moment and see if that, that is valid, if that's a valid assertion. But the thing I want to emphasize concerning Jesus is that, yes, he has a superior name, but he also has a position of power, a superior position and power. Take a look at what Paul writes. I mentioned that a little earlier in the program, but now I'm back on track. Let's go over to the book of Ephesians in the first chapter and see what Paul asserts. See if he agrees with Peter that Jesus is superior as a point of salvation. Let's look at chapter 1 and begin in verse 19, and it says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward? Referring to Jesus Christ, who believe. According to the working of his mighty power, which he, referring to the Father now, wrought in Christ. Christ simply means the anointed one, the Messiah. When he raised him from the dead. Ooh, there you go. So there were people in denial in the first century, 
that he was resurrected. There are people in the 21st century who assert, nah, he's still dead. He just created a fine religion, and some people just kind of lapped it up and have continued it on down 2,000 years later. Is that true? Let's read on. And set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Ooh, that's where he is, according to what Paul says here to the letter, uh, in the letter to the Ephesians. Verse 21, get this. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. There are many of you waiting on the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are many of you thinking, well, you know, when he comes, he's going to set everything right. Well, he is. But the fact of the matter, if you want to be in that number, when the saints go marching in, you're going to have to accept Jesus Christ and the totality of who he is. Not only is Jesus Christ, does he have a superior name and a su superior position in power, he has superior worthship. Worthship. You know, worthship is really the definition of worship. They just simply took the th out and trunk, uh, uh, strict, uh, uh, tied the word together, worth and ship, to make the word worship. Jesus Christ is superior when it comes to worship. How do I know? Well, let's take a look at the book of Philippians. If you have your Bibles handy there, just a few pages over in the second chapter of the book of Philippians, and see how worthy the Lamb is, whom we call the Son of God. Who is Jesus? Well, here's how Paul describes it to the people in Philippi. Philippi. Verse 9, chapter 2. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. You mean every name? Above Muhammad? Above Buddha? Above Confucius? Above Shiva? Above Osiris? Above Semiramis? All the gods above Zeus? Above Jupiter, fictional gods, if you will, he's above all those names? Well, let's read on. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, that means the angels, and things in earth, that's you and me, and things under the earth, those who are buried in the grave and ultimately will be resurrected, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Have you made such a confession that Jesus Christ is Lord? That means master. That means in control of your life and what's going on on the face of the earth. You say, well, yeah, minister, minister preacher, you, you sit there talking about Jesus being in charge and there's so much tragedy in the world. There's so much evil in the world. There's so much chicanery in the world. All of that is true. It was true in Jesus' day when he walked the earth and it is true today. But there's a promise in the scripture that dominion is going to be given to Jesus Christ and that he is on a countdown from heaven to return to this earth to establish the kingdom of God on the earth, so says the book of Revelation. Do you believe such a thing? You want to know why Jesus? He's not just a nice sounding name. He's just not an interesting person. And we all have a pigment of our own imagination about what he may look like. What he looks like is irrelevant. What he is is the important thing. Why Jesus? Well, let's read on and establish some other things about this miracle worker, this master teacher, this manifestation of the mystery of the Godhead. Turn over with me to the book of Hebrews, the first chapter. And in the first three verses, are powerful assertions about who Jesus is and why he is. But before I read here in Hebrews, I must take a little sidetrack. Some of you are sitting out there saying, why do you keep saying Jesus? Don't you know that his name is Yeshua? Or, let's see, how would we say that? Excuse me, yeah, Yeshua or Yeshua, maybe another pronunciation. And I would say to you, well, you know, if I was speaking to Hebrew folk, I probably would use that, but I'm speaking to people who speak English. And so the translation of his name from Yeshua or Yeshua to Jesus seems okay. 
because really, phonetically is not the important thing to know about how to sound his name. Don't you know that what the name means is far more important than how the name sounds? After all, Jesus in Spanish, spelled the same way as in English, is Jesus. If I were speaking German, it would be Jesu, that's G-E-S-U. If I were speaking Latin, same spelling, G-E-S-U, it would be Jesu. I know somebody is saying, well, you know, J didn't come into existence in the 15th, 16th century or whatever, and so it should not be pronounced that way. Listen, if you don't have a relationship with Yahweh and Yeshua, you are going to be up the creek without a paddle. It's not going to be how you pronounce his name. If it were so important that you pronounce the name in your prayers, then Jesus would not say to the disciples when they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, say, our Father. You know, I don't recall ever in my life, I'm still alive, so I couldn't have done it, calling my mother by her first name or my father by his first name. Wouldn't have gotten a good response. So it was mom and dad. But I always got a good response from mom and dad. They're the same people. But it's about a relationship. That's more important. So why Jesus? Why we, do we use the name Jesus in English? I know I could use Yeshua or Yeshua. Uh, Yeshua HaMashiach. That means Jesus the Messiah. I could do that. In Greek, it's iosis, I think it is. Oh, that's, that's for God. I, 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 crept, I slipped up there for a moment. But Jesus is okay to say that. But it's more important about the relationship. Why? Here in the book of Hebrews, we find something about his pres, uh, superior position, his manifestation of the mystery of the Godhead. In verse 1 of chapter 1 of the book of Hebrews, here's what we read. God who at sundry or different times and in different manners spake in times past unto the fathers, that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, etc., by the prophets. God sent prophets to these individuals at various times. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, okay, whom he has appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that Jesus Christ had a past experience, a past existence, that he was in relationship with the creation? Isn't that what the Gospel of John starts out by saying? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same was there in the beginning. So many scriptures show you that, and if you get the material we're offering you today, the sermon by our friend Tony Bucher entitled, Who is Jesus Christ? You will come to learn that, and learn about the personal relationship you can have with him as comforter, helper, and counselor. But more important in the text here, look at this. Who being the brightness of his glory, the Father's glory, and the express image of the Father's person, that means that Christ came to manifest the Godhead and the mystery of the Godhead, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, that's what he came to do, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, this Jesus Christ, this individual, this powerful person who is connected with the Father and then empowers his believers, his followers, to do likewise, to have miracle working power, to preach the gospel, to share the good news. Yes, he's superior to any other name that you can conclude. And the last thing I want to leave with you is in the book of Galatians, because it's a warning. The apostle Paul, talking to the people in Galatia, warned them that there would be people who would come along and suggest that an angel came to them and gave them a new revelation. Now, you'll have to make the judgment about that. Whatever religion you want to talk about, whether the witnesses for Jehovah, whether it's about the Mormon religion or Mohammedan or uh, the Islam religion, whatever religion it might be, take a look at what Paul warns in the first chapter of Galatians and verse 8. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Anathema is the word. 
So I suggest to you, if you are out there wondering about, well, why did this Church of God International and the armor of God go on and on about Jesus? Well, because Jesus is not only the reason for every season, it's because Jesus is not only the superior sacrifice, but he is the coming king to this earth. He's going to set things right, everything that we have puzzlement about and wonderment about. Why Jesus? Jesus is the only one who's going to make our circumstances work out the way we would like to, to live forever, to have new names, to walk in his authority, and to be rulers with him in his coming kingdom. So till next time, my friends, I honor you and encourage you to put on the whole armor of God that you will be able to stand in these evil days. Without a doubt, Jesus Christ is one of the most controversial personalities that ever walked this earth. Bronson James portrayed that, I think, very clearly on today's program in respect to, if for no other reason, the fact that he, Jesus, is still alive and at the right hand of the Father, if I might add, for those of us who understand that he is the Messiah. But you know, there's another very significant reason why Jesus is as important as he is. Bronson touched on it in passing toward the end of the presentation when he referenced Hebrews chapter 1 and John, the Gospel of John chapter 1. I'd like to reemphasize a bit of that portion of his presentation by taking your uh, attention back here to Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Notice this. We read, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and earth, visible, invisible, whether they're thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things, it says, were created by him and for him, and he is before all things. By him all things consist. And Paul goes on and he says he's the head of the church. Uh, he's also the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, Paul says. And in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. My friends, do you realize what you have just read here, what you have just heard, the magnitude of this statement? What we're reading is the very reality of this fact that Paul's trying to make a point on, and that is that the Creator God, came and died for his creation. That puts a whole different dynamic on this personality of Jesus Christ. Won't you let us help you to better understand this? Dial now, 888 Ask the operator for both of these free pieces that we have for you. These offers are free of charge. Let me emphasize that. Title 1, Comforter, Helper, Counselor. And of course, a one-hour presentation presented by Tony Booker titled, Who is Jesus Christ? Dial that number or hit us on the website that is indeed displayed there on your screen. Friends, this is Bill Watson reminding all of you, as we always do, you keep on that armor of God so that you may be able to stand in these evil days. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by the Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at 3900 Thames Street, Tyler, Texas, 75701, or call toll-free at 1-888-578-8791, or call one 939 2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at www.cgi.org, or email us at armorofgodcgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. This program is sponsored by the Church of God International and supported by our viewers.